posterity purposes. So, what was that? There's a raised hand icon. Should we use that? Uh, you know, whatever. Actually, either way, I don't mind just um, chiming in and, and asking the question either. Um, it really doesn't bother me at all. I, you know, if, if we were all sitting in a room together, I would prefer just hey, blurt it out. So if if you feel if you have a question you want to ask, either way, whatever works best for you, I guess is probably what I would say. I'll I keep my eyes on it. It's 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 a little bit easier to miss miss the raised hand. Um, so um, you can maybe try that first, and if that doesn't work, then blurt in. But Either way, it doesn't matter to me. I'm fairly, fairly informal about this sort of thing. So, so either way works. So again, welcome. Uh, this is our second installment in, um, in, a, in a series of, of webinars that we have planned to do. Um, the first one a couple days ago was basically it was an inverter and charge controller 101, um, sort of a what is an inverter or what is a charge controller, which I, I find useful for a lot of customers, even people who don't. Uh, who, who, who've been installing for a long time, just the differences between battery-based and grid type, for instance. So this one now is a little more specific. Um, you know, the assumption there is made that, uh, that uh, you now know what a, in a, you know, that you know what an inverter is. So we're gonna be talking specifically about a product of ours called the XW Plus. And this is sort of the second tier of presentations that we'll be doing here, you know, coming up in the near future. Uh, we'll be covering all the different products one by one, you know, just kind of an introduction, feature sets and how they're used and things like that. Um, the next uh, the next presentation, matter of fact, is on the Connect SW, the smaller unit. We'll be then going into charge controllers and all the other different products, uh, the, the CL inverter and such, which is a grid time inverter. So, and then after that, we'll be going into um, basic configuration and, um, and installation. And from there, we'll be going on, keep on rolling, and then get really application specific. That's the plan. Um, you know, it's good. This has been a great. It's a great way to reach out to to you all. I find. I mean, we've had actually a good turnout, and we have a good turnout now again. So, I hope this is valuable to you all. So again, I really encourage questions. I'm not the type that can just sit there and yabber on by myself. I like to have questions asked of me. So, feel free to try to stump me. Um, we'll just get marching forward then. We still have a couple people coming in, but uh, I think we'll uh, we'll probably we'll, we'll catch up just fine. I think. But um, first off, I guess my name is Roy Dingen. I, I work for Schneider Electric. Um, as my my title is senior technical trainer. I've uh, got a history in the industry of. I actually started on the bench testing testing charge controllers and inverters. I've worked in the sales area. I've worked in applications engineering, tech support. And what have you for well, Schneider and Xantrix in the old days, and a few of my competitors over the last 20 years. So maybe some of you I even know that are out there. Um, but anyway, that's enough of that. And forward with the XW Plus. So the fact that we have a plus on the name um, sort of indicates that there might have been a predecessor to the unit. The XW plus inverter, and there was, and it was called the XW. Huh. Some things work, some things don't. So if we look here, what we're going to do first is we're going to do a little comparison of what the new XW plus is in relation to the the previous unit, the uh, XW. Uh, you may not be able to read the the, the upcoming um, you know, chapters there, but um, really we're going to go into some brief, um, after talking about that, we're going to talk about some brief operational modes of the inverter. That's a fairly brief one because we're going to save the bulk of that for the last section, which is applications. Uh oh, somebody there can't get sound. Not good. Okay, let's see. I see. Who was that? It didn't get sound. Everybody, I think it, so. Everybody else has sound, right? We all have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there must be something going on with whoever that was. Oh, there's a couple of them. Not 
getting audio. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to march forward here. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if we're getting them or not. We may have to kind of come back here a little bit. But So after going through... After going through the some basic operational modes, we'll then go through the product components, things that um, you know, other components that work together with the systems um, that we sell, um, as well as some that we don't. Um, and then we're going to be going into applications, which that's really the meat and potatoes. I mean, when it comes down to an inverter. Uh, I like to think of it, I'm a, I, I, somebody once told me that when you're selling an inverter, you're not selling an inverter, you're selling a solution. And so um, the, 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 the last section of your applications is really the meat and potatoes. Of it. We'll cover a little bit of the application in operational modes, but kind of an overview. Um, truth be told, I, I really like to focus more on um, what it does um, than trying to sound like I'm, I'm trying to sell it to you. Um, We'll, we'll make sure that um, you get your technical answers, your questions answered. So, next. So, if we start with the previous inverter, the XW, which has been around for quite a while. Uh, it has been around since, I believe, somewhere in the 2005 range. Um, I'm not exactly 100% on the exact year it came up, but I believe it was 2005. Um, has been selling very well since then. Um, always has been known in the industry, and I know because I came from a competitor standpoint, I was a competitor against the It was always known as a dependable, cost-effective, effective solution. So, I mean, it was actually a tough inverter to sell against. And now I have the pleasure of actually selling it, so things are good. But the early versions, um, and if we go to the part numbers here, we see, you know, the, always every inverter manufacturer, battery-based inverter manufacturer, uses the same sort of numbering system, which is, you'll see here, like the far left column, 6048, 4548. These are the previous units. Um, what that means is 6,000 watts at 48 volts nominal, 4,500 watts at 48 volts nominal. But the one thing that has not been consistent throughout the industry is at what temperature and for how long that rating is. So, Unlike solar modules, for instance, which have their standard test conditions, you know, the whole 1,000 watts per square meter of irradiance and 25 degrees C cell temperature and, and so on and so forth, battery-based inverters have not had that sort of a standard test condition. So some manufacturers will call it a 25-degree rating. Some will call it 40. Some will call it continuous. Some will call it 15 minutes, some 30 minutes. There's different ways of, that people or companies have used but more and more, companies in North America in particular are coming over to continuous output power at 25 degrees C. So what we've done is we've changed the parts, part numbers to reflect and to be more apples to apples in a competitive standpoint. We, so we now call really the same power unit. We call it a 6848, so 6.8 kilowatts or 5.5 kilowatts, a smaller unit at 48 volts. Uh, Power-wise, it really is the same unit as before. Um, there are some other changes that we'll talk about, but from a power standpoint, um, it's just the way we've done the ratings now to keep to make it more directly competitive with other companies' inverters. Now, for the rest of the world, the IEC market, as we call it, uh, 50 hertz market, um, the typical uh, ratings that are used are 30 minutes at 25 degrees C which, of course, makes for a higher rating. So the same units, basically, um, have a different rating based on, you know, the competitors in that market space. So we have an 8548E, which is export, um, export to us, import to them or you there, and the 7048, which is the, large, which is the smaller unit. So that is, again, the 30-minute rating at 25 degrees C. The UL is the continuous rating at 25 degrees C, and the old rating was continuous at 40 degrees C. So that's the first major change on the XW+. Now if we get to some specs, these are all very important. 
The two left are the U.S. or U.L. versions, the North American versions, 12240. The two on the right are our um, rest of world or X4 models, which are 230 VAC, uh, 50 hertz. Um, both of them are actually switchable. For If you have, for instance, the North American versions can be programmed for 50 hertz to work in Jamaica. The rest of world units can be programmed for 60 hertz for I think Korea uses 23060, but I'm not 100% there. But you can change frequencies if you go in there and program if you choose. But the default is 50, and 50 for rest of world, 60 for U.S. Continuous output power, that we just talked about. So 5,500 watts for the 5,548, 6,800 watts for the 6,848, et cetera. I won't read all of those to you. The overload, now this is the 30-minute rating. So if you look at the rest of world units, the... Um, the 30-minute the rating is going to be the same as the nameplate rating because 30-minute is what that's based upon. Now, for the U.S. models, those numbers are the same, but, of course, it's not the nameplate. 60-second overload, which is the next item down there, is a very important one. This is one uh, we could call surge. This is how much the inverter is going to surge for, um, for a very short duration, up to 60 seconds, for things like um, motor loads and pumps and air conditioning units and these sort of inductive loads that have really high surge power requirements. Um, it's almost twice the, uh, the rated output. So you can look at it there. It's 9,500 watts for the 5,500 unit. Or for the smaller units, we'll just say 12,000 watts for the larger units across the board. Now, the charger output, this is something else that has changed. Um, Number one, you don't see a 24-volt unit, if you're familiar with the older um, XW. I believe we still are making some of the XW previous model, 4024s, but I'm not sure if that's totally accurate and for how long, if so. But the, the market for 24 volts is really getting less and less, just like... Um, oh, what was that? G-A, saw a... The FGA for IEC should be dash 61, not 01. Ah. Thank you. Apparently the part number. Oh. Apparently the part number is incorrect. Down below. You want to you'll want to double check with that when you order it. <laughs> but thank you for pointing that out. Um the charger output is we, we only offer 48 volt models, which is important. Um, things are more and more 48 is replacing 24 just as 24 volt replaced 12 volts many years ago now um, higher voltage means lower current means less charge controllers means uh, longer wire runs means better designed battery banks so the low the higher voltages are really becoming more prevalent 48 volts charger current you can see for the smaller units is 110 amps for the larger units 150 the internal transfer relay, which if you don't know what that is, we'll talk about it in detail coming up. Um, but it's 60 amps all the way across. That's for 240 or for 230. That's, um, well, the, with the UL listings, that's basically 48 amps continuous, as things like that are rated at 80% for continuous, which is still well above the rating of the inverter. Um, I know quite often people will ask, actually, for a 200-amp transfer switch in North America so that we can feed the entire house panel of a 200 amp service with a 6.8 kilowatt inverter, which is just not a good idea. So um, the idea of having a huge transfer switch, in my humble opinion, is really not necessary. The size of it is actually plenty big enough for the, for the inverter. It's, it's actually well over the rated output. So the grid cell current, so this is a grid tie capable inverter. Um, You'll notice here that we have two numbers for the, for the North America models, 40 amps and 20 amps. And that is because the U.S. or the U.L. models are, they come pre-configured, wired, and programmed as a 120-240 split phase unit, as is our grid. Um, but you can program them and do some um, reconfiguring inside, very simple, to make it a 120-only unit. And the purpose for that is not so much to run 120 loads, but in order to stack them for three phase, 120, 208, which would take three inverters wired um, in what I call series with a common neutral, so it's a, so it's a Y configuration 
120208. The rest of world units are 20 amps sell back current as well uh, for the smaller and 27 for the larger. Um, we only have one number there because there's no split phase for the rest of the world. Efficiency, 95.7 for the UL models, 95.8 for the rest of the world. I assume that that tiny bump in efficiency is due to the fact of, um, I'm, I'm going to guess it's primarily due to the transformer since we have a um, center tap transformer to get the split phase out of the UL models. All pertinent listings are there, um, UL1741, CSA, uh, IEEE 1547 for grid interconnect. I'm not as familiar with the rest of world um, um, grid interconnect um, uh, listings, but AS4777, um, we're compliant with that, and as well as CE and RCM, which I'm not familiar with, and the part numbers. <laughs> So apparently those, those e-model part numbers are not correct. I'll have to look that up at a later date. I'll take a note of that. But that's not very important anyway. When you're ordering, you're typically just ordering the unit, um, XW8548E, for instance. So I'm not sure distributor. So that's the specs in a nutshell. So the other differences between the XW40 or the XWs and the XW plus inverters, there's a few of them, and they're all good, of course. Um, the higher competitive power ratings, we just spoke about that. It's power ratings, not, not, not higher power, actually. But one of the big ones um, is the next item down, number two, which is larger systems using multiple XW plus units up to 12 units for up to 1202 kilowatts. So in the previous models, we had a maximum stack limit a stacking is, you know, using multiple inverters together in a single load center. A maximum limit of six inverters for three things, for the UL and rest of world units. Um, but one of the changes we've made, well, there, there was a couple of changes. One of them was to our network traffic on our ZAN bus network, which I'll talk more about. But we actually cleaned up that network traffic to allow for more inverters on it. So that was number one. But number two, we also have the ability on the inverter, and I'll show you the connection, to actually drive an external contactor. One of the challenges when using multiple inverters, battery-based inverters, with an internal transfer switch is the paralleling of too many transfer switches. For instance, if we were to just think real quickly of a single XW6848 has a maximum pass-through capacity continuous of 48 amps, if I was to cluster four of those together, that would give us a potential pass-through of 192 amps. Now, if the grid was to go bad, the generator slowed down, what have you, and the, in the inverters were to disqualify that load or that, that source, then there's no way that we or any other inverter manufacturer, by the way, can guarantee that all those relays will open at the same time. So the last one that opens up gets to carry the brunt of the current. Remember that 60-amp maximum relay? carrying 192 amps is a recipe for potential problems. So when we go to these larger systems, one of the things that we do is we use an external contactor to actually do the transferring as opposed to the internal contactor. And the newer XW Plus units actually have a connector on the bottom of the unit that is used to trigger that external contactor that we specify and um, gives you the ability to go larger systems without having all these parallel 60-amp contactors. So it's a much better way of doing it. Um, we can do off-grid AC coupling. Um, I should specify that. It's off-grid or on-grid. Um, but the, the challenges in an AC coupling, um, um, you may, we'll talk a bit about AC coupling towards the end if you don't know what that is. But, but the challenges of AC coupling are not so much when the grid is available, but when the grid is not available and we have a routine for actually slowing down um, the grid tie inverter in an AC coupled situation. Again, if you don't understand that point and what AC coupling is, don't worry, we're gonna cover that more. Um, improved battery management. This one to me is one of the best. Um, we have, and it, and it involves an additional piece of hardware um, called the Connects Battery Monitor. So, so as many of you know that have worked with batteries, battery voltage is not a great, state, um, great way to tell the state of charge of a battery. Um, a, what we call a Coulomb counter or a battery meter that 
monitors AC or DC amps in and out over time is a much better approach. Um, we've always sold them. Um, you know that we had. You may be familiar with the TM500. It's been sold by Schneider's, Antrex, Trace for many years, um, as well as other battery monitors. But the thing is, is those battery monitors did not speak on our network. So the inverter wasn't aware of the state of charge of the batteries, even though another one of our products was. So we couldn't use that information. Now, with this new product, it connects battery monitor that ties into our Zanbus network. And I'll show you some pictures of that. We're able to not only monitor the state of the battery, but make decisions based on the state of the battery. You know, for instance, auto gen start. No longer are we tied to just doing auto gen start based on battery voltage. We can now do it based on state of charge of the battery, which is a much better approach. So number five, support for charging lithium ion battery packs. Now this one comes with a warning. This does not mean that you can go onto eBay, buy a bunch of bulk lithium ion cells, solder them together into a big box, and then just turn on lithium ion support in the inverter and be safe. Do not do that. Um, you, you most likely will have a catastrophic issue. Um, very bad. What it does mean is there's actually three ways, two ways that we'll split the one into two, um, that we can actually deal with um, lithium ion batteries. Um, lithium ions are, are any of the lithium technologies, there's multiple things that fall into that category, are all very different, and they're very different than lead acid. And every inverter that I've ever, you know, um, worked with, and I've worked for all of my competitors in North America now, um, was designed to, to charge a lead acid battery bank. And as such, connecting it to um, a lithium ion, and lithium ion, just because you say the word lithium ion does not mean a particular chemistry. There's lithium iron phosphate, lithium, oh, there's all kinds of them. And so what lithium, all of the lithium technologies need is an onboard for the battery onboard um, designed specifically for that battery bank, BMS. And there's two ways that they do this, really. The first way is that some manufacturers have basically said, well, we understand that most inverters, or if not all inverters, or chargers are designed to charge a lead acid battery. So we're going to make a make a BMS that makes our battery appear as a lead acid. So they are able to, um, to basically connect to a battery-based inverter, um, the one that's designed for lead acid, and safely charge it. One of the things that they have to add to that is what I call a Chernobyl switch. And what that is, is if the battery pack exceeds its maximum current, whether it be charging or discharging, it has to have an internal relay to disconnect itself. So internal to these types of batteries is a disconnect relay. So if you exceed the current capacity of the inverter or the battery banks, um, instead of having them explode, <laughs> it disconnects them, which is problematic in a battery-based inverter because if we disconnect the battery, the entire system shuts down, and it's not self-recoverable. You'd have to go back, reset the um, – you'd have to redo everything, basically. Um, so, so what we do is we have a programmable, when you select lithium ion, we actually have the ability to set the maximum number of amps you want the inverter to allow before it shuts off. And you do that at a value lower than the battery bank uses for disconnecting. So instead of opening up the relay, we just shut off the loads, leaving the batteries connected. So that's the first one. The next two are battery, battery banks or battery manufacturers with their own BMS that actually talk to us. So instead of us, when I say us, the inverter, running the charging algorithm, the, battery, the battery's own charging algorithm tells us what to do. They tell us, for instance, to limit current, change voltages, those sorts of things based on their requirements. And they do this in one of two ways, either over... Um, our ZAN bus, which is the best way because it can talk directly to us um, and we release all that information to the battery manufacturers. Um, and the other is over Modbus, which is a more standard operation. Um, it's not as direct into the inverter, but it works fine as well. 
And so um, when we say support, I just want to make sure that you understand that the, you, know, you need to speak to the battery manufacturer and preferably us as well prior to doing it. Don't just connect random bulk cells and expect it to be safe. Um, we've got an expanded portfolio of balance of systems components. Of course, inverter people, when we say balance of systems, we mean wiring boxes um, and wiring products. So we're actually adding to that, uh, that the, 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 our portfolio of balance of systems components. We've got some really nice tools for installers. Um, things like um, computer interface for the, for the network that, we can do, that the installer can do all the programming it with over a PC using drop-down menus and such as opposed to pushing buttons on a, um, on a display, which is never fun. Um, things like email alerts and, and web access and you know, remote access to programming and some new cloud services as well. Um, for monitoring and, and lots of new things that we're not going to go too deep into today. Um, and also some grid, some advanced grid interactive and smart grid functions. Um, for instance, in Hawaii now and in, here in the States, they are becoming less friendly, if you will, to net metering and they're not allowing, in, in some places in Hawaii, they're not allowing people to sell back at all because of grid saturation issues and grid quality issues. So we've got some advanced grid interactive and um, self-consumption features that you can program in the inverter to allow it to utilize the solar as well as your storage optimally to, um, to utilize all the, store, the, the solar produced in the course of the day, over, use that energy over the course of the night. So I won't go deep into that. That's a whole other topic for a webinar, um, self-consumption. But that's really all the changes. Um, actually, um, yes, that is all the changes. Okay, I was thinking I missed one, but I did. So operational modes, this is pretty brief. Um, and then we're going to go into some components and then we'll go back into applications, which is a little bit more detailed. So what we have here is your typical, um, uh, uh, Portfolio of, of Schneider products with all of our, um, you know, our inverter. We see the XW plus inverter here. We see our, our high voltage charge controller. This is the 600 volt charge controller. Um, we see, and this is on the DC bus, blue in any of my drawings or any drawings we re release now, I think, in this, for this purpose. Or blue is DC, red is AC. So on the DC bus, we've got P PV modules coming in through a charge controller battery to the inverter. We've got AC out going to your loads. Um, here we have a grid tie inverter. This is actually an RL inverter, which is not available in North America, but being AC coupled, if you will, to the, to the XW plus inverter, which again, if you don't understand AC coupling, I'll talk about that. It'll be our last slide actually. Also on the AC bus, well, the inverter has two inputs, um, which is, makes wiring much easier, and particularly in a battery backup um, application with a generator. You don't have to use an external transfer switch. Um, we have one AC input for grid, one AC input for generator. This dotted line bus here, this is what we call Zan bus. And so what it is, is all the products that we make, uh, all the smart ones, um, actually are on a daisy chain called Zan bus. And so here we see the, the, the charge controllers on there, goes to this thing called the com box which the com box gives you the ability to, um, well, you can program the inverter and, and, and the, uh, actually all the devices in the network via your PC in a much easier fashion than you can from the system control panel. Actually, any more, I would almost, in my own system, I would probably use this over this, although it's not nice to have the control panel as well. Um, it also gives you the ability to tie this out to a router and get out to the web and do web monitoring on our new Connect Insight uh, web portal. Uh, you can actually, um, um, di well, not dial, but um, you know, uh, browse directly into it, and even do um, configuration and monitoring directly into the inverter or into the system. I'll say. So that's the com box. Next to it, we see the Connect AGS. That's our auto generator start system. Now, this is only necessary. This is one thing I like to point out. The AGS is only necessary when using a three wire generator. So if you have a two-wire generator, there's actually ports, which I'll show you on the bottom of the inverter, that give you the ability to do two-wire start. Now, if you have our battery monitor, this is the battery monitor I'm speaking of, 
installed. Oh, I have a question. I like questions. Why use the for the RL while AC coupled? Woo, that's actually, I was going to ask that question earlier, too. I know, for instance, and I'm not sure, but I think the reason that's not drawn in there, this wasn't my drawing. The, I know that the CL inverter and the older TL inverter did not communicate on ZAN bus. They communicate on Modbus. Um, so that's why I believe, and I could be wrong there, and what I would recommend doing is that for anybody that who, who has that question specifically that really want, needs it answered, shoot me an email. I have an email address at the end. If I, if, I'll forget unless you email me. But email me basically to find out if, in fact, the RL can be tied into Zanbus because I don't know the answer. So thank you. You stumped me. If I could hand out a prize of today, I would. Uh, let me see here. I had another question, too. When will lithium-ion applications note doc did it be available and referenced in the owner's manual? <laughs> oh, um, oh. <laughs> I just got an answer. No, the RL cannot be tied to Zanbus. And when would the lithium ion note be, be um, referenced in the owner's manual? I'm not sure. And that's not a decision I would make, of course. Uh, but I'm not sure it would be referenced in the SW owner's manual. I'm, it probably is released today. I mean, I believe it is available. Um, one of the thing, oh, it is on page 113. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to this, but, oh, no, it is not. No, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, we, got a, we got a battle going on. I love it. Um, the, the note, in my opinion, or in my, to the best of my knowledge, one of the things right now is we're, we're, we're actually doing is kind of getting a handle on what is available as far as tech notes and things like that and making them easier available. One of the things I've learned is that there are a lot of things available that are not easily available as far as t um, tech notes and things, and we have our product manager working very hard on that. This, this issue comes up with other notes as well. So look forward to a much better and easier um, interface on the website to getting all these types of documents. That document that somebody was just asking about, about the um, lithium ion, is a very good document. Um, I, I actually helped I proofread it myself. Um, very good document. So we have an answer to the RL. The RL does not speak on ZAN bus. So does it respond to frequency shift? Uh, maybe I can get an answer from, <laughs> from the gallery as well. I don't I, no, it does respond to frequency shift. That I do know. Yes, it does respond to frequency shift. Unlike, um, you know, when it comes to, when, you, when you're doing AC coupling, in my opinion, one of the things you need to do first is speak to the manufacturer of, um, manufacturer of the grid time inverter, if it isn't one of ours, or even if it is one of ours. As an example, and this isn't any way, shape, or form to, to knock, you know, competitor products. But for instance, Fronius um, Power One do not um, uh, AC couple. So if you have a Fronius or, or a Power One, it will not um, it, it will not be capable of AC coupling. So matter of fact, I was told by a great friend of mine at Power One that they will void the warranty if you AC couple. So. So always check um, and check with us. There's, we have a paper as well. There's an AC coupling solutions guide as well that covers this pretty well. But um, the one that I know best of that works um, you know, from the North America market, because the RL is not um, available in North America, the one that I know that works best to my knowledge, which is a company that I was just working for recently, <laughs> um, is the Sunny Boy. Um, and they, you know, they do. They do um, listen to frequency shift as well. So, so this is the basically the whole um, you know both. So we're looking at things in the DC bus, things on the AC bus, um, and we'll get more into applications here a little bit later as well. So, from an inverter standpoint, just from the inverter itself, this this part's very straightforward and simple. So, what we're showing here is sort of a block diagram of the inverter. 
And you'll see that the two inputs are here um, on the XW Plus, and we have the AC1 for the grid and the AC2 for generator, and then the AC out, which isn't la it's labeled as load, but that's labeled AC out on the inverter. So if you look at it now, both of those transfer switches are open, which would tell us that right now, if there was loads being powered, they'd be powered by batteries, and there would be probably no grid present or no generator present. If the grid was present, the inverter would look at that AC coming in, qualify it, and then close the relay, passing it straight through to the loads. Note, when I say straight through, I mean that. It's not any kind of power conditioning. And also route energy down to the charger and to charge the batteries. AC2 is the same thing, but note that if we were to close both of those at the same time, it would be very, it'd be, well, it would be catastrophic. So the inverter won't allow that and it'll prioritize one or the other. By default, that priority is AC1. If you choose, you can have that default prioritized to AC2, so that, for instance, if you had grid coming in and somebody started the generator inadvertently or, just to, or even just to um, uh, charge the battery or you know, keep it warm, warm it up once in a while, exercise it, the AC2 transfer or pass relay would not close. So. That's just the inverter in a nutshell there. So real briefly, we're going to go more into applications, don't worry. So we won't, we won't get too hung up here. But if you look at the upper left-hand corner, we see that both, both um, internal transfer switches are open. Nothing's going on, no loads. We're in standby. Um, the second one to the right there in the middle, um, both transfer switches are open, but we have energy going out to the loads. That means we're in invert mode. Um, we're converting energy from the batteries and, you know, the DC into AC to run the loads. On the far right one on the top there, we're in pass-through mode, which means that the AC is passing through, but the inverter is not inverting or charging. It's just in pass-through mode. So we're not actually contributing. We're not doing any kind of grid support, um, anything like that. Um, the, on the bottom left, we have AC coming into the inverter, running loads, and charging the battery. So this could be um, basically in non-grid support mode, if you will. Um, but um, that probably be the best way to describe that. On the right side there, we have what I would call grid support mode and AC input support mode, what I like to call it, where you're basically sharing energy on the DC side, and whether that be you know coming from the batteries, coming from solar, what have you. And there's different purposes for doing that, which I'll talk about. Um, and sharing that DC energy onto the AC bus, you know, whether that, that could be solar coming in on the DC bus to share with the AC bus, et cetera. We'll talk about that more when we get to applications towards the end. But what is the maximum current in AC pass-through mode from AC1? Well, the relay is rated at 60 amps. And um, for US or for the UL and NEC, there's a, you know, we, we use an 80% um, continuous rating, so it would be 48 amps, which is why I said earlier that the relay is, when I say it's plenty big enough, the reason I say that is 48 amps times 240 equals 11,520 watts of pass-through. Now, in what I would call a well-designed system, you shouldn't have that much load on the output of a single inverter. Because when the grid goes away, that 6848 is not going to be able to handle 11,520 watts of load. So though people will ask for larger capacities of pass-through, to me, that is a Band-Aid. Well, well, most of the time, it's a Band-Aid for not wanting to pull a sub-panel in a backup situation. That's the biggest reason. So, um, But we will get to that. Um, and you'll note, um, and these drawings here are actually drawn correctly in that the relay is on the correct side of the path to the charger or, you know, on into the inverter. So that the relay, anything going to the loads as, as well as the charger do have to go, oh, this is a better one, do have to go through that relay. So the maximum you can set the AC input amps to is, well, it's going to be either 56 or I think it might be 56. Or 60, but it's not going to be, um, you know, more than that because we don't want to bring more in that end. So, we, in other words, 
we cannot pass through 60 amps as well as use, you know, the wattage required to charge at 105 or, 100, uh, or 110 or 150 amps. So the maximum pass through is 60 amps, continuous is 48. So um, here all we've done is we've added a little bit of solar to the mix um, and a generator. Um, you know, we spoke about that a second ago, about the AC2 coming into the generator. That's no different, really, than AC1 coming in. I call this, that's why I call um, AC input support. One of the things I'm going to point out right here is for those of you who don't, I mean, there's, I've already got a couple of questions here on AC coupling that lead me to believe that people out there have heard about AC coupling and probably even based on the questions, know quite a bit about it. But, but for those of you who don't, AC coupling means that things are tied together on the AC side. DC coupling means things are tied together on the DC side. However, in the solar industry, when it comes to battery-based inverter systems, what that terminology really means is DC coupling means that your PV array or your renewables, it could be wind as well, I guess. But, well, for the most part, we'll just talk about PV is tied together onto the DC bus via DC to DC charge control. So that's what we mean by that term. And if we go back to, and I'll get to more of it again, AC, AC coupling means we're bringing the array onto the AC bus via a grid tie inverter. And we say grid tie, but think of the AC output of the inverter at that point, of the battery-based inverter, as the grid. So we're grid tying into that. So good time to point this out. So we'll, we'll have some drawings at the end that kind of go a little bit deeper into that too. But we'll keep moving forward. So components. So we talked about most of these. I won't repeat them. Um, but here, actually, the one that I didn't go too deep into was a two. We offer two charge controllers. Um, these are DC, of course, you know, the DC charge controllers. Um, this one on the right is our. Um, our MPPT 6150, the way the numbers work on charge controllers for us is 6150 means that we have 60 amps content or 60 amps output with 150 volts max open circuit voltage. Uh, these are both MPPT devices, so they are DC to DC converters, so we convert that maximum um, 150 down to desired battery target voltage. The other controller there on the left is our MPPT 8600 which means 80 amps output, 600 volts input, which is really nice. If you have a customer that, um, that has a grid tie inverter installed, it will say that it's a grid tie inverter that isn't capable of being AC coupled and they want to add battery backup. Your choices are a couple. Um, you could put in an AC cup or an, a grid tie inverter that does cooperate with AC coupling. That would be one option. The other option would be just to go to a 600 volt charge controller and not have to rewire your array. Um, there are, you know, there are many debates, and I could talk for, for I could actually try to talk for two hours on AC versus DC coupling. Um, let it be said that I'm in a small or a residential application. I'm a believer in DC coupling. That doesn't mean that I'm absolutely right, but I personally prefer it. Um, Especially when you use all, if you're using all, you know, um, Schneider equipment. For instance, monitoring. If we had a Sunny Boy, which does AC couple with us, tied to our system, we would not be able to, on the system control panel, nor the web portal, monitor the output of that other inverter. So, really, to bring it in all the DC side um, and and be able to monitor it is, is it, it's a better benefit right there. But also, anytime you're using energy that has gone into the batteries and come back out again, in other words, non-daytime loads, so about 80% of the day, it's more efficient to go directly in via charge controller, in my opinion. Because um, though daytime loads, you can say that the conversion from um, grid tire inverter straight to loads um, is very high efficiency. That's true. That's only for four or five hours a day. The rest of the time, it has to go to the batteries first. And when it goes through an AC coupling routine, we go through, we get the losses of the grid time inverter, we get the losses of the inverter charger, and then into the batteries, where on DC coupling, we're going straight into the batteries for, via a very high efficiency charge control. So there's my two cents. So I, I prefer DC coupling. So again, okay. 
Is there support for shunt measurement of a foreign grid, foreign grid inverter? Shunt measurement. Um, you, so like for instance, okay, for SMA. So to measure it, you could, this gets a little, little bit beyond the scope of today's discussion, but Schneider Electric has power meters um, that I don't talk about today that are just power meters that tie together on, um, they actually are Modbus capable. And so you can go through a external power meter, one of our power meters with just the grid time inverter, and you could tie that into the com box via the RS-485 and get around that. It'd be a little bit of, it'd be a little bit of configuring, but nothing's impossible. So from that, you now know that at the end of this presentation, when my email address and phone number goes up, the reason I put that up there is because I like crazy applications. If you have them, please call me and email me. So um, there's always a way. <laughs> Can we do both? Oh, oh, of course. We'll get to that at the end, but they are not mutually exclusive. Yes, I'll get, we'll get more into that here. But yes, we can do both. As a matter of fact, I prefer it. <laughs> so the components, I'm going to fly through this. I, I, based on the questions, I've got a good crowd here. Um, so I want to get to applications. So I'm going to go through the components real quickly so I make sure we have time. Um, if you look here, we've got the bracket for hanging the inverter. They stack neatly next to each other if you have multiple inverters. Air filter goes on the bottom. The air comes in through the bottom over the inductors and heat sinks, not against the sensitive electronic. We don't bring dust and moisture into that and blows it up out of the top. So please do not put your manual on top and block airflow. You will notice, however, something important. There's no side ventilation as some inverters do which means that we can butt them up next to each other. It makes for a very neat, clean installation, particularly on the larger systems. Battery terminal covers. Um, you get one with every charging device as well with the, as with the battery monitor. You only need one as they're all tied together on Zanbus. Network terminator, that's for the daisy chain. The last item on the daisy chain in either direction needs a network terminator. We provide that. This aux port connector goes in the bottom, and that's where you connect your relay or your wires for your two-wire start generator, as well as things like the external contactor for larger systems, and we give you a Zanbus cable. This is what the inverter looks like. Don't need to go too deep here. The front panel here has got an information panel. There's no programming capacity there. Um, if you're doing a, oh, I've noticed a battery terminal bolt at the bottom of the inverter could be longer. Uh, are you ended up? Are you double stacking? Do you do you, you should have? I have a better picture coming up, and I'll talk about that. Okay, we'll get to that. I have um, a better picture at the bottom of the inverter. So the the um, doesn't have really any programming capabilities. But if you were to use the system control CP in a smaller system, you can actually remove this display and put the system control panel in there and make it an all-in-one. Package AC wiring in the bottom low, bottom left hand corner. Here we have the terminals. So I just got a comment that the battery, um, the battery cable bolts could be a little bit longer. I haven't actually hooked one up, but generally speaking, there should be only the flag terminal from your battery cables going to this. One of the things I used to work in repair back at the trace days. And one of the things that often installers would do is that they would put nuts or even a washer between, uh, um, you know, on the old inverters had a post, not a hole like we have here. Um, and we used to call it double nutting. So for instance, if you were to put washers in between the battery cable and this post, well, post, this terminal, you would actually get voltage drop across there. So you should have the battery cable flush onto this with nothing in between it, then the bolt with its washer, which I would guess is going to be a lock washer, but I don't know that, um, is that number one on the question of, of the bolts could be a little bit longer. Is that how you connect it? And I'll look into that too. But do you put anything in between? And or do you have two battery cables coming to it? Not getting an answer on it. Well, anyway, you shouldn't. <laughs> Here are the knockouts for your AC wiring, ground lug, 
that's where that uh, that fan filter goes. This is the fan sucking in the air, blowing out the top. On the left, we have AC sync cables. Those are the ones used for tying the inverters together for stacking or, or clustering, as some people call it. Zanbus, there's our for our daisy chain on Zanbus, BTS connection, and where that little terminal block goes in for those you know, for the um oh the auxiliary terminal, which can be used for different functions, including generator start and as well as the terminals for the uh, external contactor. No, nothing in between, only one lug if using Unilux lug, etc. Okay, I'll look into that, but email me. Actually, I'll forget, <laughs> I promise. Um, but email me and I will look into that. See, this is one of the things I like about doing presentations is I learn as much as you do sometimes, and that's a good thing. Okay, onward. AC connections in the bottom left-hand corner. Here we have on top the UL version. So we have line one, line two in neutral, AC one and AC two in, and then AC load or AC out. The IEC version, the only difference is there's no line one, line two, there's just line in neutral. Um, so that's basically your AC connections inside the inverter, pretty straightforward. From, from a standpoint of balance of systems or wiring boxes, we offer something called the power distribution panel. So what you see here is the inverter, the power distribution panel and the conduit box that ties these together. So I'll have to illustrate some other pictures, but that just shows you what they look like. I guess I'll get inside and talk about what's in, what we get. At. So for the UL version, you get the PDP box, you get the one, one of the XW plus conduit boxes, you get some jumpers, you get, you get your AC input, your AC output, and your bypass breaker, as well as the, um, the bypass, I call it the wigwag, so it doesn't allow you to have the output and bypass on at the same time. Um, you get your DC breaker. You get the battery cables that go between the inverter and the DC bus, as well as the, um, the, the breaker. So you get your wiring up to the box, and then your battery cable will come in. You get your AC wiring for your AC input output, and um, AC, the AC... For if you're wiring a generator, you will have to add the, another set of breakers. Um, that's externally standard um, two pole square D QOU breakers, and of course some grommets for you know for for uh, um, uh, making a nice soft edge on the on the knockouts. The IEC version, rest of world, is a bit simpler, and that's because there's so many varieties and variations and breaker choices in different countries. So. What we do for the for the rest of the world, and you can actually use it in, in North American market if you wanted to as well. It just comes with thin rails and the and the um, and the DC stuff. So we don't give you any AC wiring or AC breakers, um, but we just have the thin rail for the standard IEC type breaker. So much simpler, of course, less money, um, and that's what we do for the rest of the world. So if you're going to be using up to three inverters, you can use a single PDP and purchase one PDP, of course, and then two, for instance, here, of the connection kits. And the connection kits come with the AC, or the, AC the, the, the conduit box, as well as the DC and the AC wiring. So applications. So, priority power is another word for um, grid support mode, or what I call generator support, or not what I call AC input support. So, really, what we're doing here is we're combining the um, the the solar or whatever it, whatever source of DC we have, even just batteries for some applications, along with the AC. And the purpose of that, of course, is to utilize the solar. So, if you have an inverter, for instance, or you even have a XW inverter without grid support enabled, what would happen after the batteries were full is the charge controller would just um, curtail the output and just and the energy would not be used at all. So the XW plus being a grid support type of inverter, or what I would call a bimodal inverter, I guess, it actually has the ability to pro be programmed for um, doing what we call grid support. Now, standard grid support, the way everybody has done it for a while now, um, what's important down here is the order of power use. So with standard grid support, your first priority is solar. 
That makes sense, I'm sure, to everybody. We want to use all the solar energy we can. In a grid support only application, which we can see that this arrow is not bi-directional, so we can't sell back in this one here. We have not programmed it for sell back. This might be in a jurisdiction that doesn't allow it. If the batteries are full and the loads are low, we may not have anywhere for the solar to go because we can't sell it back to the grid. In that case, we will be throttling as well. But the first priority where the grid is available is the solar. Second power priority is the battery. And this is the way um, standard grid, grid support works. We'll dip a little bit in and out of the battery. Not much. We're not going to be cycling the batteries. We'll let you program it to. And the third is going to be from the grid. Now, this is fine if you're losing power every day. But we have something in the XW Plus that's new um, that we call enhanced grid support mode. And what this does is since, number one, this has to be done with a DC coupled system, this has to be done with a ZAN bus enabled charge controller or our own charge controller. And the reason for that is that the inverter and charge controller are talking. So it's not just a matter of voodoo set points and when the battery voltage gets up to this point, I'll start doing that. That's what the way um, standard grid support works. So here, if we look over at our priorities, first priority is solar. Second priority is grid. You'll notice that there is no um, priority for battery use at all. So what is going to happen here, effectively, the grid is never going to charge the batteries unless the power has gone out and the batteries are cycled down to a point that we call recharge. So in most applications, the, all the three-stage charging of the batteries is not going to be done by the inverter. It's going to be done by the solar charge controller. Because the two can talk, we have the ability to do that. What that results in are two things. Number one, better efficiency, because we're not using the grid constantly to, cycle, to charge up and down the batteries like you do in standard grid support mode. But also that little bit of cycling, a tiny microcycling, if you will, of the batteries, though not much of a cycle, <clears throat> does have some impact on battery life. Maybe not a huge impact, but some. And battery cycling costs can be high in a battery-based system. So you're going to save money. So my opinion on this is that if you're having a situation like I ran into in South Africa, where they were losing power every single day for four hours, I would use standard grid support mode. And the reason is the batteries are always going to be maintained full as a priority, and that's going to be done by the inverter, the charge controller, whoever is there available. If you only lose power once in a while, then you can use, then I would use enhanced grid support mode. Your batteries might only be at 90% sometimes, but they're going to be lasting longer and you're going to be higher efficiency. So, um, so that's my opinion anyway. You, for you know, daily applications, uh, use the three-stage charging of the inverter. So one of the things that priority or, or, or enhanced grid support does is it takes the three-stage charging out of the inverter, puts it into two-stage charging, which means that it will not charge again until the batteries fall to recharge voltage, which can be set pretty low. Um, the solar charge controller is the one handling the three-stage charging. So um, one of the things, too, here, this enhanced grid support mode, um, just like AC and DC coupling I mentioned earlier are not mutually exclusive, either are enhanced grid support mode and cell back. So you can do enhanced grid support mode with a cell back system as well. So that really will increase your, your efficiency of the system. So another thing, another way of using this AC input support, um, it's really the same function just for a different purpose and under different circumstances, is peak load shaving, or what we call parallel power. And so what we're trying to do here is to limit the draw on the grid to keep the consumer out of a higher tier level of, um, of billing. So for instance, I was talking to somebody recently, I don't remember where it was, but they had 15-minute they had data, monthly billing kind of thing. So what that meant was if they exceeded a particular value and exceeded a, a threshold or a, um, a tier for 15 minutes, it changed their billing cycle for the entire month. So even exceeding the input on their, you know, their, their draw on their, on, their, on their utility connection for 15 minutes a month 
could as much as double their power. Um, it's not always that drastic, but um, basically for tiered billing. So in this case here, you're using your solar, of course, to offset the, you know, the, the, the peak load, but you're also using your battery. So this case here, um, we're not really using something like um, enhanced grid support mode because we are prioritizing the battery over the grid because if we really, really want to keep ourselves uh, from drawing over the set point um, that we have programmed in the inverter for, um, for any period of time, and we're willing to use the batteries for that sort of stuff. So the battery's purpose in life, really, is to provide that buffer. So we try to get it from the grid um, up to a certain level, but then once it gets close to that level, we start contributing from that DC side, whatever that is. So grid cell mode, again, this is another function that has to be turned on. So, you know, we had before, we, I said that you had to turn on grid support. Well, you had to turn on, to turn on grid cell, you have to also turn on grid support. But the only difference here is, is that if you have excess, in other words, we have solar coming in, the batteries are full, and the loads are low, that excess will actually go out through the AC input. So um, we do that based on the batteries and the state of charge. Um, not much different, um, but we can also do enhanced grid support mode. And then we're just primarily, we're really only selling solar. We're not selling battery power. Um, and, we, and we still allow the batteries to go through a full three-stage charging cycle every day. Um, any excess above and beyond those individual targets. In other words, if we're in, we go to bulk in the morning with the charge controller, any energy above and beyond bulk will go back to the grid during the absorb time. Once we go down to float, then any energy on the float will go back to the grid, but we'll never pull from the batteries unless we hit refloat again. So much, it's, it's, it's a better way to do things, uh, more efficient and easier on your batteries. Generator support. Again, all these AC input support routines are really the same thing for different purposes. Um, mixing the DC from the DC bus into the AC bus. And the primary reason for doing it with a generator is not to add together the capacity of the inverter and the generator. So in other words, this doesn't mean that you can take a 6.8 kW generator and a 6.8 kW inverter and run 13.6 kW of loads. That's not what the intention of gen support is for us or anybody else. The intention of it is to be able to use a small generator. Um, if you have a backup system, for instance, you may not want to have a, um, you know, a 10 kW generator. You may just want to hook up your small portable generator in those long power outages just when there's not enough sun. And you can program the inverter to not draw more than the generator is capable of. So in other words, if I have 30 amps of load on the output of the inverter and I have a 15 amp generator, we will utilize the 15 amps that we programmed it for and not bog down the generator, but we will assist that with the battery energy to run the loads. That's the purpose of it. So again, similar in function, similar in, um, you know, as, a, as grid support or even as peak load shape, but just for a different purpose and using different parameters. So AC coupled, this came up a bit. I had a hard time wrapping my head around this many years ago when I first heard about it. The idea of using a grid tie inverter off grid until it dawned on me that a grid tie inverter needs to have a grid to synchronize to. Define grid. So if we look at the output of the inverter in this case, think of it as a grid. Now that we have a grid, we can tie to it with this grid tie inverter. One of the things that's also a, 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 the case here is any excess energy that's not running the loads from this grid time inverter will go back into the battery based inverter and charge the batteries. Very good so far. One thing that every battery based inverter manufacturer has as a challenge or a limitation, I'm not sure what it is, but something inherent to the design of inverters, is that though we can charge on the output side with an AC coupled grid tie current source inverter, we do not have the ability to regulate the battery charge like we do when we're charging from the input. 
So if we're charging from the grid, we can draw just what we need to keep the batteries at whatever, whatever voltage we want to and do all kinds of fancy charging algorithms. When we bring it in on the AC side like this, we lose that capacity. Everybody does, not just us. Sunny Island does, Outback does, Magnum does, we all do. And so there are routines that people use to overcome this, to, to build in charge control, if you will. The first way I saw it done was using a voltage control relay, which could be the auxiliary port on the inverter, to run an external relay to disconnect this inverter. So when the batteries get full, we basically put this inverter into error mode. That's one way to do it. Um, not very smooth, but it works. It keeps you from overcharging the batteries. Second way that it was done was something called a diversion load. And a diversion load is nothing more than a programmable load tied to your battery bank. So you have some kind of a voltage controlled relay that turns on a load that is sized, well, actually a little bit larger. My, the rule of thumb I've always heard is 125% of your renewable resource. So in other words, if this was a 5K inverter, you'd want a 6K load, a very dependable load, tied to the battery with some control to bring turn it on by voltage. So when the battery voltage tried to go over a particular voltage, we turn on the 6KW load, bring the batteries back down to the desired level. That's what diversion load is. The problem with doing that, you can think about that. Here I was using a 5KW inverter, which would necessitate a 6KW load. Now this has to be something that has to be on all the time. So just simply hooking up a 6,000-watt 6, 6, heater or a water heater, um, that always has to be capable of being turned on is not always convenient. Um, and in a larger system, it gets even worse. You know, think about a, a 10KW. Um, in AC couple mode, if charge block is enabled, will the batteries charge and what stops? No. No, charge block is only from the AC input. Good question. Yeah, so you know, we have to do, um, and the reason for that, charge block is a function that we want to limit our use of the grid. The only reason we would ever want to use, um, limit use from the solar would be because we have too much. So, um, yeah, so no, charge block will not limit what comes in on the AC output side from an AC coupled source. So really it comes in unregulated completely. Um, and that's where we have to do these external things. So if AC coupling will disable grids, okay. If AC coupling will disabling grid cell, no, another good question. So if you are, if you are AC coupled, that AC power is just on that AC bus between the inverters output and input. There's no way to limit that. It will sell back. So AC coupling um, in a situation on grid with no net metering agreement is not a good solution. Yes, WS Smart Charge. Well, the Smart Charge is basically, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, enhanced grid support from with an AC coupled system. Um, I'm going to guess that's coming to the um, the XW plus, but I don't know. Uh, the firmware in the SW is actually newer <laughs> than the XW plus. So, yeah, the SW has a function called Smart Charge, which effectively so we can do this enhanced grid support um, with a DC coupled source with the X X XW. That was one of the things I mentioned. Um, um, enhanced grid support is done, charge controllers, AC coupled side, or DC coupled side. SW does have the ability to do um, basically enhanced grid support with an AC coupled source. Probably part of the reason that's necessary is the SW will not do DC coupled sell back. So the only way you can sell back with a, with a with an SW would be AC coupled. So that might be why. Okay, frequency shifting on a lightly loaded off-grid systems can cause the RL to disconnect if batteries are full. May need a load during solar production. Okay. Um, frequency shifting on a lightly loaded. Yeah, I can see that. Um, 
I can see that. AC coupling is sort of a um, imprecise science to a certain degree for everybody. Even you know my previous employer was a, was an SMA, and even they are. It's a little bit clumsy. Um, it's not quite as smooth, which is why I'm not a big fan of it, to be honest with you. Um, we can AC couple. We can enable frequency shift on both the CSW and the XW plus. The only time that I would be doing an AC couple system would be in a larger off-grid, um, like in a village electrification type of a project. Uh, and even then, coming back to the question that came up earlier, can I AC couple and DC couple at the same time? Yes, you can, and I would. Because one, one of the limitations also of AC coupling is, for instance, let's say we have a system, system off-grid. It has a backup generator, and the generator is out of fuel. The, we have a couple days without sun. The inverter goes into low battery cutout because it doesn't have enough solar resources to keep up with the loads. The inverter shuts down for low battery cutout to protect the batteries. Now the solar can't charge because the grid off grid or the battery based inverter is not on to provide a synchronizing signal to it. So that's one of the fall one of the drawbacks of AC coupling. So even in these large systems where AC coupling is very useful because you can have the array um, you know, on grid time inverters throughout the village, um, for instance, or up, you know, up on the hill or wherever, um, far away um, on the grid, um, I would still, I do like seeing DC coupled solar on, on anything close by because that gives you direct access directly into the batteries. So in an AC coupled system and per design, the XW set up a three-stage charging from the inverter source. It won't, well, not really. <laughs> So, so three-stage charging means that the inverter has regulation capability. It has the ability to control an algorithm. This is why, oh, when we're using, though, when we, when we do program it for AC coupling, so we're off-grid now, we're off-grid, um, programmed for AC coupling, which means that when the grid is not available and the battery voltage reaches a set point or a target, it then shifts the frequency up to signal the grid tire inverter to slow down. So now, does it do that in a three-stage fashion? Yeah, I believe it does. I believe that's something that's new. I'm not 100% on that. Okay. I'm getting a yes on that. Um, yes, it's new. Okay, good. Okay, so I am right on that. So, yes, it will do three-stage charging off-grid um, with an inverter that will listen to it. Or actually, even if you had an – see, there's really three kinds of grid tie inverters in the world, I guess, when, in, in, in terms of AC coupling with us. There is inverters, for instance, Feronius, um, that just don't say synchronized. They can tell because of their, their anti-islanding routine – they can tell that it's an inverter or that it's not the grid more correctly. And they just don't stay connected. So they just don't work. The second is an inverter, and I don't know of any good examples of this, but they will stay connected, but they will not listen to frequency shift as a methodology for slowing down or curtailing their output based on a signal from the inverter, uh, from the battery-based inverter. So that's the second kind. Um, what will generally happen there is when the inverter frequency shifts, that grid off-grid inverter or the grid time inverter will see that frequency shift as a bad grid event and go into an error mode and then prevent it from overcharging the battery. So that does work too. Um, but the third and the best is an inverter that actually listens to frequency shift and throttles its output based on that. That's the best scenario. So ideally, you know, like for rest of the world, for single phase, we have the RL. For three phase, we have CL. Um, that's actually 480 you know, higher voltage. You have to use a transformer. But for North America, for 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 North America, for AC coupling, I'm not the only one. I mean, it's, I, I don't like recommending other companies' products, but when I when but when um, but when it's when it's appropriate, I will. Um, for North America, if you must AC couple, Sunny Boy is the way to go because they do respond. So I don't have a drawing here of um, 
I don't have a drawing here of um, you know AC and DC coupling put together, but in essence, it's it's like I said, not only is it possible, but it's what I would almost call. If you're going to do AC coupling, I would do a little bit of both. There are limitations too to AC coupling. One of the things that you run into on limitations is um, on larger systems. You know, I mean, my my favorite example of where AC coupling doesn't work was a telecom site I was working you know working with, and they had a 5K continuous load, 24 hours a day. So if we work that out, 5K load, one XW plus would be plenty. Now, if they were to X, if they were to AC couple that, so they got 5K continuous load times 24 hours. I'm just using rough numbers here. That's 120 kilowatt hours per day. Divide that by, we'll just say, four hours. And that's a 30 kilowatt array. So if I was going to AC couple a 30 kilowatt array, to a system that had a 5 kW load requirement, I would have to have six XW pluses as well as 30 kilowatts of grid tie inverter. Very costly system. If I did it DC coupled, I could tie a single XW plus to a large battery bank. I mean, it would be a large battery bank either way um, with 30K of charge controllers and be just fine. So in, in cases like that, you run into a bottleneck because all the charging capacity of the array has to go through the battery-based inverter. So um, again, if you have continuous loads 24 hours a day and you have um, a large array requirement, um, it is actually considerably cheaper to do a DC coupled system. But um, the one I worked with, they ended up doing just enough AC coupled array to basically run the load during the day and take advantage of that high efficiency conversion to go straight from the grid time inverter to the load. So loads react badly to rate of change of frequency hertz. Is it a picture? Is it flickering? So, uh, I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not ideal really to change the frequency. Now, our, our frequency shift is only a couple of hertz. But it can be noticeable, yeah. And if you're running loads that are sensitive, there's one more good reason not to do it. I would agree. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, there's a big debate now. And I think, um, you know, having myself come from SMA, um, you know, they really believe that AC coupling is the end all for everything. And I just disagree with that. I think really um, for most battery-based systems, DC coupling really is, there's a reason why we've been doing it longer. <laughs> but, again, my opinion, and I'm glad to work with anybody that wants to come along and do an AC couple system as well. So, I believe... Oh, oh well, yeah, okay. Talked about all that. That's, our, that's my last slide. And we went 20 minutes over because of all your good questions. So I commend you, number one, for asking the questions, and number two, for hanging on with me. So, any more questions, comments? Thank you. Yeah, I enjoy I enjoy this. It's a little bit different than standing up. I I'm, I've always been one to enjoy standing in front of a crowd and, and doing a presentation. But uh, so it's a little odd sitting here in my home office by myself doing. That. <laughs> but it works really well. It's a great way to reach out to people. I think so. Um, Thank you all for coming. It's been, uh, I mean, I, like I said, a lot of great questions this time, and I really appreciate them and comments. All right. Well, thank you all. And any, like, again, you, you, there's what you see on the screen. There is my email address, and believe it or not, yes, that's my cell phone number. Feel free to call me with questions, systems, weird problems. Not tech support, but, um, you know, we have tech support department. But, I mean, if you're doing a, uh, an odd system and you need some help with it, I love, I love working out uh, strange, strange applications. So, so I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you all very much for coming, and thank you again for all your questions and comments. Um, the next, uh, well, you all got this information. The next discussion we're going to have is going to be on the, C or the, um, the CSW inverter. Um, so we, we spoke a little bit about that today, but uh, that'll be the next one. All right. Thanks much. Goodbye.